good afternoon to everyone joining us. I'm Josie Madison. I'm the editor of New York Archives Magazine. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this first, to the premier event of our online speaker series. Today, we're joined by Lincoln Scholar, acclaimed author and Archives Partnership Trust board member, Harold Holzer, along with author, reporter, and New York Archives editorial board member, Paul Grandal, for a discussion about Harold's latest book, the Presidents versus the Press, the endless battle between the White House and the media, from the Founding Fathers to fake news. Harold is one of the country's primary authorities on Abraham Lincoln and the political culture of the Civil War era. Harold spent 23 years with the Metropolitan Museum of Art, retiring as Senior Vice President of Public Affairs in 2015. He currently serves as the Jonathan F. Fanton Director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College, and co-chairman of the Lincoln Forum. Harold has authored, co-authored, or edited 52 books, including the award-winning Lincoln at Cooper Union. Harold is also a cherished Archives Trust board member, having served since 1992. A recipient of countless awards, he is also a lecturer and commentator and can be seen on C-SPAN, NBC, MSNBC, CNN, and the BBC as well as performing Lincoln programs on stage alongside the likes of Sam Watterson, Richard Dreyfuss, and Diane Weist. In 2017, he was presented the Archives Partnership Trust's prestigious Empire State Archives and History Award. Paul Grandal is the director of the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. An award-winning journalist, having worked at the Albany Times Union for over 30 years, his projects on domestic violence, death and dying, mental illness in state prisons, and the problems facing sub-Saharan Africa have won local, state, and national journalism awards, including the Scripps Howard National Journalism Award. The author of several books, Paul was also named Albany Author of the Year in 1997 by the Albany Public Library. In 2004, he was named Notable Author of the Year by both the Gilderland Public Library and the East Greenbush Public Library. He's been featured on C-SPAN's About Books, and Book TV. No stranger to presidential history himself, Paul is the author of I Rose Like a Rocket, The Political Education of Theodore Roosevelt, published in 2007. Paul and Harold will have a discussion about Harold's new book, after which we'll have a brief question and answer session. So feel free to submit questions throughout the session in the Q&A panel on your screen, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Without further ado, I am pleased to introduce Harold Holzer, and Paul Grundahl. Thank you, Josie. That was wonderful. Good to see you again, Harold. I'm, I'm holding your book. It's, it's a fantastic book is what we're going to talk about today. And we'll talk about a little bit of our 40 year, you know, friendship and, and, and connection. But the book is just out from Dutton. It's called The Presidents Versus the Press, The Endless Battle Between the White House and the Media, From the Founding Fathers to Fake News. How are you doing, Harold? This was a, a tremendous amount of, of scholarship and, and work. Thanks, Paul. Great to see you. Um, we have known each other for, I think, close to four decades. It's scary. Yep. Listening to Josie um, reel off all those numbers, 30 years here, 20 years here, for both of us, it's a little scary. Um, but we're still standing or sitting. Uh, and thank you for the nice words about the book. This is a strange time. I mean, Last time I saw you, you were at the University of Albany campus for Albany Book Festival. I've gone to all those wonderful Archives Partnership Trust events in Chancellor's Hall there, you interviewing Ron Chernow, David McCullough, these superstars. How are you handling the pandemic first and foremost? Well, it's, uh, it's as you know, and you know I'm gonna give full credit to Governor Cuomo, um, it's, it's a lot, less tense and anxiety producing than it was in, in April and May. Um, so we're home in the suburbs and uh, pretty isolated. Um, I'm getting a lot of work done for Hunter College. We've sort of regrouped educationally, as I, I know you told me about Upstate as well, where we're conducting classes online. Our students at Hunter College have acclimated our public policy and human rights Students may not be going to the UN and they may not be going to city council hearings, but they're learning from really good professors and they're learning to take tests on all these new systems. I'm glad I never had to do it. 
I mean, I yes. taught classes, but I never had to do Zoom <laughs> So I, I want to start by uh, your introduction. I learned something that I didn't realize, that you were a cub reporter just out of college. Was it the Manhattan Tribune? Was Manhattan it? Tribune. So, yeah. um, and, and then you had a long career as a, as a press person for Congresswoman Bella Abzug, for Mario Cuomo. Um, so you've kind of been on both sides. Right. Uh, and, and there is this adversarial relationship between politicians and the press. So which was more fun, being the reporter or being the press spokesperson? Well, it was more fun being 20 than it was being 40. <laughs> more fun being 40 than now. But uh, I loved it all. I loved those days as a cub reporter working for these hard-boiled editors who were right out of the movies. A fellow named Paul Weissman, who must be long gone now. Who had a, you know, a bottle of whiskey in his drawer, which oh, yeah. at five thirty, and <laughs> really brutal to me. Made me do this, you know, thirty-page story, which he cut down to a couple of paragraphs. <laughs> and I, uh, that was my first story. I got to ask him, why, you know, why did you make me do all that work? And if you were just going to do a box, and he said, that's that's how you learn, boy. That's how you learn. <laughs> and so it was great. And this newspaper was in such precarious financial shape that uh, little by little, the, the, the old time editors peeled away and left because they weren't getting paid. And there was no one left but me <laughs> and my wife really. And we, future wife, who I'd known from high school, but we ran the whole thing. We, we, we put the paper together. We had a typesetter and a designer. Ultimately the designer left, we were, pasting the paper down ourselves, bringing it to the printer. The printer would hold it ransom because we weren't paying the printer. It was, it was a great three and a half years. And when I complained to the publisher, who's, who, whose name is interesting, I'll, he was William Haddad, who was a well-known uh, person in the Kennedy uh, political world. Um, he was the publisher. And he was married at the time to Franklin Roosevelt's granddaughter who he had met on a newspaper. They worked together on the, on the New York Post and the Herald Tribune. And he said, you're working with Edith. This is the most fun you'll ever have. And in a way he was right. And I, <laughs> I remember that, he, that that was a, a, uh, an accurate prediction. I look forward to that chapter in, in your memoir when, when you write oh, yeah. it. Well, um, I've done enough, I did enough memoiring hinting in this book. I've never done that before. So, um, Obviously, you, you focus on about 19 of the 45 presidents in, in great depth, and we, we can talk about Teddy Roosevelt, who I've written about his early yeah. career before the, before the White House, but um, I'm interested in the, the person, and you've had this role, the press secretary or the press spokesperson. You've seen many of them in, in your lifetime of different presidents. What does it take to be good, and who have been the best and worst? I think of Sean Spicer, who had to get Trump told him to say we had the biggest inaugural ever, and he became a, a Melissa McCarthy joke on Sa exactly. uh, Saturday Night Live and things. Exactly. But, so who, who have you seen that's done it really well out of recent presidents? Well, I, I went back, you know, the first person to hold the role officially, although others had held the role um, unofficially as assistants to the president. But Stephen Early, who was Franklin Roosevelt's press secretary for 12 years under different titles, may have been the best. Certainly he, he organized press conferences beautifully. He locked journalists into the room so they couldn't scoop each other at the end of Roosevelt's Oval Office press conferences. He somehow got away with banning reporters who try to break the gentleman's agreement about photographing Roosevelt um, um, in his wheelchair. Uh, eventually it was, it was a rule, not a gentleman's agreement. Um, and he represented Roosevelt really well. Didn't get into policy, and that was sort of helpful in a way. His, his negative was that he was an unreconstructed neo-Confederate. I mean, his great uncle was Jubal Early, the Confederate general. And Franklin, as a result of his influence, Franklin Roosevelt did not allow a black reporter into a press conference until 1944, wow. 12, 11 years in, to his presidency, and that's pretty brutal. Yeah. But Early was good. Um, Pierre Salinger was good, also was not always briefed, but he had great relations with the press. 
Um, I'm a big fan of Bill Moyers. Yeah. Uh, I love Bill. He's a friend also, but um, uh, he said at the beginning that he was also a senior advisor. And the fact that he was making policy recommendations in, in, in White House meetings, and then occasionally coming out of those meetings to speak in behalf of policies he didn't believe in, compromised. And he gave him an ulcer, as I write in the book. So I, you know, he was, he may have been the most brilliant person ever to hold a job, but he, I think it tortured him. Um, right. And, uh, and he regrets it. Modern people, I don't know. Um, uh, Clinton had some pretty good press secretaries. Um, I think the, the, the role is descended now into such an argumentative uh, role that, um, that Kelly McEnany is, is a disaster in her own way because she fights with everybody. She doesn't, she doesn't provide the information. You ask me what it takes to be, and, and cause you were on the other end, you have to tell me if I did all right. My, I think my job was to stay in the confidence of the boss. And obviously that means intense loyalty. And um, one of my rules was always to say, I don't know. If I was asked a question and I didn't know, I didn't make it up, I didn't argue a line, I said I would, work to find out the information. I would also say I can't comment when I couldn't. Right. And my other rule was never lie. And right. It's just, it's like a basic thing. Say you can't say, but never tell an untruth that you know to be an untruth. Because if you lose the respect and the confidence of the journalists, um, then, um, then you're, you're a disaster. Yeah. Uh, even, if, I mean even if you battle, even if you complain. So, I hope I did okay with you. And I know Rex Smith, who I conversed with at this year's Albany Book Fair remotely. Um, we're still friends 35 years later, so. Exactly, you're still friends. And, and we know we both have jobs to do and, right. and the respect goes both ways. I think you were respected because you, you, you know, handled the job just as you said. And, and we realized that you were hired by the politician. You're not hired by our newspaper or whatever. You had a job. I just wrote an appreciation on Jerry McLaughlin, who was well respected by the yeah. press. Now, he was on the Republican side. Yeah. But again, you felt like you were getting an honest answer. He wasn't trying right. to spin you. He would say, I can't say. Sometimes he would drop little crumbs and you could follow the trail to get a, a story or a scoop. But again, reporters just want to be. Uh, feeling that there's a level of trust and honesty between realizing that you're on two sides of the, the you know, the equation. And, and Kennedy said it best, even though he palled around with reporters all his life, and even though they covered for him on both his extramarital flings and some of his medical issues, um, when, the, when his staff assumed that it was all palsy wowsy he would say, he would remind them, this is by nature, an adversarial relationship, and don't forget it. And uh, and I think that's a healthy adversarial relationship. Insults, right. demonization are not healthy, but the natural tension between the president and the press, I think, makes both of them do their job better. Yeah, I, I also like how you you draw. There's kind of two general ways that the president can try to handle the press. One block them out, obfuscate, not give them much access. The other is to bring them in and make them feel like they have access and they're friendly. So the two extremes I would look at in your book, Teddy Roosevelt, who I wrote about, he did this in Albany. Right. Let, the guy, let the reporter sit on his desk. When he's in Washington, you tell great stories when he's getting a shave and he gives them access. Right. And then Nixon, who has the enemies list and, and basically you know, tries to block out and, and tries to undercut the press. So, so who was more effective between Teddy Roosevelt and Richard Nixon in, in the kind of message that they wanted to portray to the American people? I mean, there's no comparison. Nixon right. was fighting with the press from the day he declared for Congress in 1946. And certainly during his prosecution or some say persecution of Alger Hiss, he, he thought the press didn't um, appreciate him. And when um, uh, a, a journalist uncovered this, this kind of innocent sounding slush fund that he had collected to give to pay for Christmas cards, it all sounds so innocent. He was compelled to buy time to give his famous checker speech 
to say that uh, you know he was innocent, his wife had a cloth coat. He never trusted them after that. And when he sent, even before the enemies list, when he sent Spiro Agnew on a speaking tour to attack broadcast journalists, talking heads, newspapers, and implicitly threaten their broadcast licenses the way Trump does today, that was the that was the final straw. And frankly, what did it do for him? It got them on a mindset to get him. It was like their mission. The mission was retribution. And they've, of course, the same guy who's after Donald Trump today, Bob Woodward, right. uh, all these years later, 50 years later, is still doing the same thing. But back to Teddy, which you, who you wrote about so brilliantly, I reread your book, set, set the Stage, and, and then at least got to mention that he did in Albany, and so did FDR do right. in Albany, uh, provide access. So those barber's hours where, where he welcomed journalists in, and meanwhile, he, Teddy, like FDR, hated the publishers generally. He hated Hearst, he hated Pulitzer. He sicked his attorney general against uh, one of them. Uh, it, to his last day in the presidency, he was doing a libel suit. He made, put it in a congressional message. We think Trump is, is tough toward the press. But he understood that he, he, was, he became president in an age of front page journalism more than partisan journalism, even if it was sensationalist. He was a sensation. You know, right. the same way he was said to have demanded to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral and the baby at every christening. Right. He expected, the journalist wrote, um, and I, I read a lot of memoirs of people who covered him, the great stuff, but he, he expected to be on the front page every, every day. Right. And he was pretty often. And when he, somebody else was coming up with a big story, he, would, he introduced swamping, uh, the method of getting out of your own story to finish the other story. He invented leaks and trial balloons, and he named them all, right. not just the lollipop. At the same time, he was cultivating working journalists. Um, and by the way, he was tough with them. He told them, everything is off the record. If you violate it, you're in the Ananias Club, which is this imaginary purgatory that he invented for anybody who went out of line. And it was named after the, uh, the, uh, the biblical figure who lied to St. Peter and was struck dead by God. That was his <laughs> club. And he would ostracize reporters. He would throw it. But he also welcomed them into the first White House press room they ever had. And all while that's happening, he is cultivating relationships with long-form investigative journalists like Ida Tarbell and, uh, uh, and Ray Stannard Baker and others. Lincoln Stephens, Lincoln Lincoln Stephens, Stephens. Jacob, Jacob Reese, he, he, he met them all in, when he was in Albany, yeah. Right, and he, yeah. and he continued, yeah, Reese used to go around with them on police raids, even when he was police commissioner, right. but he used their articles as ballast for his reform agenda in Washington. And then, of course, ironically, when he was finished with them, he, he condemned them as muckrakers. That was not meant as a compliment in his famous speech, and sort of left them by the roadside. They had served their purpose. He was one genius and um, more than one of his press contemporaries who I, whose memoirs and recollections I read said that he was the master public relations man of all time. Yeah, and he, he also understood it from the other side because he was a brilliant writer. He wrote a lot of, of uh, journalism for hire, you know, travel logs, hunting things. He, he published three dozen well-regarded books, so he understood what, what it took to be a writer and to write a story or to write a book. And, um, and I found evidence that he was, uh, uh, it was suggested to him after his uh, comeback failed in 1912, that he should become editor of a New York Daily paper. And he actually played with, a little bit with the idea in his head and thought it might be fun, but by that time he was working for a magazine producing another series of uh, articles to the, to the very end. But yeah, he would, he would go off on a toot about things like he hated the idea that animals were humanized in, in, in uh, fiction. Mm. And he went on a toot about, about it and wrote articles and gave speeches about it. And that was typical of Roosevelt, swamping all the media with speeches and articles and interviews until they got his point across. Yeah, I, I also love learning so much from, from presidents that I thought I knew a lot about, like, like Teddy Roosevelt. I can see you're having a lot of fun in this book because 
un unlike your Lincoln scholarship where you dive to the bottom of the ocean in a, in a narrow thing, this is 19 presidents and, yeah. and you, you pick a slice, you know, and it's very focused, but you seem like you're having fun with this book as much or more than all your other ones. So how did this, you know, doing that wide canvas uh, challenge you or interest you as a writer and historian? Well, it definitely was a challenge to go back in time and forward in time from the Lincoln era, which I focused on for so many years and decades. Um, but as you know, Paul, I, I developed an interest in press and Lincoln and wrote a book about Lincoln. And, and that just inspired me to trace the, the whole history of major relationships. And as you say, I didn't do everybody. I did 19 of the 44 men, 45 presidencies. Um, I thought I had to do the founders, Washington, right. Adams, and Jefferson. Jackson was such a seminal figure in transforming uh, the press relationship and making it, you know, safe for journalists to work in the White House in behalf of the president if they were partisan enough, sort of a precursor to the Sean Hannity, Donald Trump relationship. And I, I just decided at a certain point to do everybody who was in the recollected memory of readers of the book. I'm not sure I did, did the right thing by deciding to do Carter and Ford, and, but there were stories about all of them. And, you know, it was hard to find presidents who really left office saying, I just love the press. Uh, I had a great time with the press. Carter was particularly uh, um, angry about the press's focus on gotcha journalism and not on accomplishments like Camp David, he believed. Right. Uh, right. Although I think that's kind of a, you know, a one-sided uh, reaction. So, 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 yeah. So you end the book with, with he's kind of the, the gorilla in the room, always Donald Trump, our 45th president. What I like is that you kind of defy expectations. People think, you know, that he's probably the worst since enemy of the people, fake news he attacks, but, but you have a very balanced view and you put it in context that he, he was certainly probably not the worst and, and probably not out of line with how every press or every president tries to control. And you even include a little bit comparing him to Barack Obama, who was kind of a darling of the press, that he may have actually taken more actions to limit the scope and power. So, so talk about Trump and then maybe compare him to how he and Obama each dealt with the press. Well, one of the, the two main themes in the book are that um, other presidents have been much tougher on the press than Donald Trump, who I argue is, has a bark that's a lot worse than his bite. Uh, John Adams uh, enforced a federal, a ridiculous federal law that made it a crime to um, ridicule the president. And he forced his attorney general to prosecute at least 17 journalists and even the widows of journalists. Um, Jackson brought journal, gave exclusives to journalists who were working inside the White House. Lincoln and his administration, <coughs> excuse me, and his army closed more than 200 newspapers all Democratic anti-Lincoln newspapers during the Civil War, arguing that their editorials against the draft and against enlistment were close enough to treason. Wilson closed, you know, jailed editors. Roosevelt cracked down during World War II. So, you know, by comparison to them, Trump is just full of wind. Um, and that's the argument I make. Not every critic is like that argument. They they think the bombast is more corrosive than prosecution. I would argue not. And then the other theme in the book is that the presidents who have, who have been the best communicators are those who take advantage of technologies that permit them to bypass the press. Journalists may not like it, but by the end of the Civil War, Lincoln was using the telegraph, which by then was controlled by the military, to write dispatches about the last days of the war as Grant took Petersburg and Richmond, he was not only the commander in chief, he was the communicator in chief. Um, FDR mastered the radio and delivered 28 fireside chats that were so effective that people imagined he was on the radio every day of the year. Um, JFK with his televised news conference became a, a television star um, and, and sort of got the journalists to go along. Eventually they realized they were getting so much airtime they liked it. Right. And, uh, and 
you know, Obama had the White House website, but Donald Trump with Twitter belongs in that category. He right. not only communicates directly to his base, but he really creates the news cycle on many days. Not in, maybe not in the campaign, but on most fallow days, he'll write an outrageous tweet and cable news will spend the whole morning commenting on it. So Right. But he's, he, he's also the yeah, the first president, which you bring out, I mean, you talk about throughout the centuries, the, the presidents that that understood and, and used the new technology to bypass the press, which is always the best, unfiltered, you know, they, they can't yeah. fit their own. But how do you account, and, and you kind of gloss over it in a certain sense, 20,000 documented lies by President Trump, according to the Washington Post, and now journalists have to real-time fact check him. Did that, that never really happened before now, right? I mean. No, and it, it's never happened. And um, I think the greatest threat that Trump has uh, perpetrated on, on the body politic, well, not the greatest, but in terms of the media, is that he has changed the, our, our universal respect for the objective truth. If we can never agree on facts, uh, then we can never come close to a consensus on point of view. I think that was a warning that uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan gave one day. There can be no disagreement about facts, but yes, there can. That's the big danger. I think that goes beyond press relations, just goes to yet another pillar of society that's no longer held in esteem. And <laughs> truth is a victim. If you look at public opinion surveys, some of which I quote in the book, Americans have lost respect and you see declining numbers for the court, the military, the press, the Congress, the presidency, there, much less the CIA and the FBI and the law enforcement. So we're, we're in a perilous time. I just, I don't think it's, it's due, due only to the relationship between the president and the press. We're in a, a partisan era that harkens back to Jackson and Lincoln. Right. And that's the scary part. So the book is The Presidents Versus the Press, published by Dutton. You can find it at your local independent bookseller. You can find it online. It, it's a terrific read. I learned so much about presidents who I thought I, I knew almost everything about. Um, and, and it gives context from the founding fathers to this current president. But I think we have some questions. Is Josie uh, going to jump back in? Um, I know we've got some people who have some direct questions for you, Harold. Yes, yeah, so we actually have a question that came in um, that's about what you were just speaking about, about facts and truth and objective truth. Um, so thinking about some of the work of Kathleen Jameson, who um, co-founder of, of factcheck.org. She wrote, I think her recent book is Cyber War. Um, so some of her work in communication tactics, um, what do you think are the best ways to break the sort of endless cycle of saying politician statements are false or lies? Just saying that they're false is not necessarily an effective response, but what might be an effective response or how have perhaps, um, how has that been approached in, in history by other presidents or by well, other press? Thanks, Josie. I wanna hear Paul on this too, but so I'll give my response. Um, the tradition of not agreeing on basic truth in news reporting, especially where presidents are concerned, is not a new, is not a new phenomenon. It's, we have the same situation now as we had in most of the 19th century. I'll give you one example. After the first Lincoln-Douglas debate, um, Link, the Republicans walked to the speaker's platform and carried Lincoln off on uh, the crowd's shoulders. So the Republican newspaper reported, after the debate, Lincoln's admirers carried him off in triumph on their shoulders. The Democratic press reported, after the debate, Lincoln was so exhausted that he had to be carried off on, by his supporters. So this is not a new phenomenon. Um, how do we come to consensus? We don't always come to consensus. There's nothing ingrained in, uh, in, in, in the founding documents that insist that we have to agree on a common truth. I just think we have to relax about partisan journalism. If it's back on cable news, I think cable news should, should concede that it's partisan. In other words, let MSNBC say we are the progressive 
cable news network. Let Fox say we are the conservative news network and let us understand the filtration systems that they use to report and analyze news. I just think that's one, that, that's one thing that we, that we can do. I don't think we're, I just think we have to grow up about it a little bit. Um, because it's part of our culture for a hundred years of, of American journalism. I, I agree, but I do think this president is, is, is very enamored of authoritarian leaders like Putin and, and Erdogan. I've been to Russia and Turkey in the last three years, and I've seen when you don't protect democracy and, and free press and press freedom, it's a perilous, uh, terrible situation. And uh, I do think we have to guard it. And luckily, we still get a chance every four years to- That's what I was just going to say. You know, voting is, is, is something that, that it really bothers me when we get a 50% turnout. You know, it's just, it's, it's the greatest freedom and the greatest bulwark against, you know, somebody who's taking the country in a dangerous direction. So it's really up to the people on November 3rd to, to have their voice heard. You know. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have another question that I personally love, which is, uh, what archival resources did you use in your research for the book? We love, we love to talk about archival Those archives questions. Well, <laughs> as, I, as I say in an adaptation that you've been kind enough to agree to publish in um, archives, uh, in New York State Archives Magazine in an upcoming issue, I think the, the resource that I love the most um, in this project was were the FDR papers at, uh, at the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library. Um, so while the papers of Theodore Roosevelt and Thomas Jefferson and George Washington are available online, and I certainly did most of my research online, um, the, the Roosevelt and Kennedy and Johnson I had a great deal of fun going to presidential libraries and reading the transcripts of press conferences or listening to press conferences. So there are, there are uh, archive papers and there are also now video things that you have to uh, become, become uh, cognizant of and aware of. So the, the original Lincoln papers in the Library of Congress are also tremendously useful, although they are online. I will say, Josie, I'm going to make one, I'm going to issue one warning for historians of the future or even of the present. This is not true of the New York State Archives, but it is true of the Library of Congress. It is becoming increasingly difficult for serious scholars to access original papers. We are being pushed to microfilm and online resources in an effort to protect the original papers. And you know, after doing this for 40 years, I must say that there are things that are not picked up in, um, in microfilm or microfiche. I know that's true in the Lincoln papers. Lincoln loved to cut out newspaper clippings and put them with his incoming material. And it's not always, included. and I just think it's a loss. I think we have to learn to balance um, making resources available to historians and protecting them for future generations. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and from my own research, I can say sometimes it makes all the difference, the weight of someone's handwriting on the page, which often doesn't get picked up in microfilm. So that's, it, that's it, another good point. I mean, God bless the people who do the transcriptions uh, and uh, the downloading because it's, a, it's so much easier for historians to do research now in 19th century newspapers. Or for example, I've been to Hyde Park many times, but I didn't have to spend time in the papers because I could do it all, everything's online. All of those, all of those news covers, all of the fireside chats, I just press a button. Well, most people press a button. I have to press 20 buttons to find it. But I listen to all the fireside chats again. But the best part to me is the research, like for, for Teddy Roosevelt, the Houghton Library in Harvard has all his handwritten letters and you can see campfires, stained smoke, and you can see water stains. And, and uh, I, I mean, I love that part of it. The writing part is the heart. Like I, I would have fun just doing the research, leaving the writing. Um, 
But for instance, uh, you did some other a great opportunity in this book, which I forgot to ask you about. I'll throw it in now. Uh, you got to interview a former president. Can you talk about that interview? Yeah, I will. One, I have to say one thing because of what you said about stains. New York owns the draft emancipation proclamation. Yes. Right? That was issued, well, t today, it's tomorrow is the anniversary, September 22. Wow. Uh, if I've got my dates right. It's a long story about how New York State acquired it, one of the great moves by the state legislature to buy it. But if you get to see the original, which one can do every few years, it's got Lincoln's fingerprint on it from where he glued in a, a something he cut out from a piece of congressional legislation. Can't always get that sense of humanity and uh, with, with, with uh, a transcription or uh, a photograph. Okay. Back to the president. I'm not avoiding the question. Um, I did ask two. I asked uh, George W. Bush and Bill Clinton. Um, president Bush just doesn't like to talk. And I must say, um, President Clinton did not really want to do this. I saw him at a, I sent him a letter. Um, I got word from his office that he would probably do it. I then saw him in a restaurant in New York City and went up to say hello. And I said, Mr. President, don't forget to go. Yeah, I remember. I <laughs> Then I saw him at the opening of Harvey Firestein's one person show, Bella Bella, about Bella Abzer. Bill and Hillary Clinton were at the opening. I went down this aisle, up the aisle. I said hello to Hillary and to President. I said, hello, Mr. President. Said, I know, I know. I got to get you those. I got to. And he did. And he did. So I, I, I had to do a lot of pushing, but, and his answers were fantastic. I asked him if he bore any, uh, if he had any regrets about the way his office handled the press, because things got ugly pretty quickly with President Clinton. And he does regret, he, he says the biggest mistake we made was closing the door and locking the door between the White House press office in the basement and the press office of the president one floor up. They decided to seal the door so that people weren't wandering around. Now other presidents have done that. Nixon banned the press to the basement, covered up <coughs> the, the famous Franklin Roosevelt pool to create the current press office because he didn't want them around. But when Clinton did it, the press was furious. And they treated him with anger for some time. So he regrets that. He generally thinks the press was fair in retrospect, but um, I would say that he still is angry about the press focus on early investigations like Travelgate, um, so-called, like um, Whitewater, and right. especially, especially the focus on Vince Foster, folk, um, questioning whether he had really committed suicide. Um, he just was very pained by that, and I think uh, Secretary Clinton was too, because he was a family friend. That really you know, angers him. Very quickly, that chapter, I love the little detail you put, the because he has a sense of humor, the sign. Can you describe that sign in his office? Oh, you... yeah. Well, I did, I did, I did, got to, got to tell a President Bush story based on having met him a few times. Yeah. Um, when, when President Clinton gave us a tour a few, you know, years ago, at the very beginning of the, um, of the, um, the scandal about his extramarital doings. He took us to his upstairs office and there's a sign on his private desk that said, I, I, now I don't remember, he said either be quiet or speak softly, Ken Starr may be listening. Right. <laughs> and uh, it was, a, you got a sense even in the beginning of a beleaguered White House, um, with all the lights shining in from outside, it's like really being in a in a greenhouse that's who, with in an orchid greenhouse with the lights shining. You can't see outside, but everyone can see inside. It's kind of an isolating uh, existence. I'm not sure why any. I guess it's fun to be president, but it's brutal as well. It's not just the press either. So we have, I think, one last question here. Um, which president do you think has done the most to alter president press relations? That's a great question. Um, I think 
How about if I do a few? <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt for sure, bringing informality and access. Franklin Roosevelt, 998 press conferences in 12 years, not just in the Oval Office, but in Hyde Park, at Warm Springs, overseas, on battleships. Um, he was accessible and so accessible that I think the press persisted in respecting his privacy regarding his, his paralysis. And then I think if you, one more who did a great deal is Richard Nixon. He may not have intended to. Because of his secrecy, because of his hostility, because of his angry press conferences, because of the lawsuit over the Pentagon Papers, because he sent Agnew out to be a, a tack dog on the press, and because of Watergate, he did more than any other president to foment the gotcha culture that I think has dominated White House press coverage. And I understand it in a certain way. Uh, I don't blame reporters for dreaming of becoming um, Woodward and Bernstein and writing and getting 20 book contracts for a million dollars each and being portrayed in the movies by Dustin Hoffman and um, Robert Redford. That's fun. Um, and look at Woodward, he's still Bob Woodward uh, 50 years later. But I think it has given, given reporters this sense that they can bring down a president if they just get the right break. And instead of doing detailed coverage and instead of um, uh, asking policy questions, they, they're guilty a bit of looking for TV moments at presidential news conferences and scrums. And I'm not sure that's, that's healthy. And we can blame Nixon. He created the atmosphere under which in a certain way we're still, we're still functioning 50 years later. Harold, this has been a lot of fun. It's a wonderful book, but a prerogative of the interview or one final question. There must be a story to that flag behind you, the commemorative flag that's folded. Is it a, a quick story? I think we do have to wrap up, but I, I've been looking at that and wondering. It's pretty quick. I gave um, uh, the, the speech at the Gettysburg National Battlefield three years ago on the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. And as part of the ceremony, you walk over to the um, Pennsylvania Monument, you lay a wreath for Union soldiers, then you walk back to the platform. <coughs> I gave the speech, and when it's over, they have taken down the flag that was raised over the monument and put it in that display case, and that's the speaker's gift. That's wonderful. So that's my story. That's great. great. Well, thank you so much to both of you, Harold and Paul, for your time and for such a fascinating conversation. Um, so be sure to see Harold's article in our upcoming issue of the magazine, which I actually just sent to the printer last night, so it should be hitting mailboxes very soon. Um, if you're not subscribed to the magazine, now would be a great time to do that. You can do that on our website at nysarchivestrust.org. Harold's book also is out now. Um, and can be purchased at the major retail stores. So make sure you get yourself a copy. And stay tuned for our next online speaker series event at 12.30 p.m. on Tuesday, October 20th, where we'll be joined by New York State Archivist Tom Ruller and author Bill Greer, as they discuss insights from Bill's new nonfiction narrative of 1872 New York, entitled A Dirty Year, Sex, mm -hmm. Suffrage, and Scandal in Gilded Age New York. And you can again visit our website at nysarchivestrust.org for more information. And thanks again to Harold and Paul for a great kickoff to our online speaker series.